What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Before I introduce you to Dave Will from Prop Fuel, Dave, I always like to mention past episodes that people should check out. Um, there's some interesting ones, and based on the research I did on you, um, Kevin McCardle of SureSwift Capital, um, and you could hear how he vets companies, how he evaluates companies, and um, you can also check out. Uh, Jimmy Zolo of Collaborata, and he, we were talking about your son's company, which we'll definitely give a shout out to because people could buy hats and Hawaiian shirts. Was it the Kona brand? Yeah, the Kona brand. The Kona That's brand. My boy, boy. twenty-year-old is uh, is making Hawaiian flannels. Pretty damn cool idea. But um, and, and you know what? Anybody right now that's dealing with money, we're raising some some money for prop fuel, and I, I, so that's something I'm interested in knowing more about. Is uh, uh, what you, what you said about how you uh, value companies and you know that uh, I'm assuming if this guy's a money man he's he's probably evaluating a lot of companies and their pitches. Yeah, I've had a bunch of um, private equity and venture capital people on, and it's really interesting to hear what they look for and how they evaluate these companies, right? And eventually, people are going to either sell their company or um, raise money. Right. So I figured it'd be really powerful to have those episodes on the podcast. So check out those. You can go to inspiredinsider.com. You can search venture capital in the search bar and pull up anyone can pull up any of the ones that I've done. And they're all different types of spaces, whether it's CPG or service professional. So software, check it out. Um, and I am going to introduce you to Dave Will before I do. This episode is brought to you by Rise 25. Uh, and at Rise 25, we help businesses connect to their dream 100 relationships. And we help that help them by helping you run your podcast. And for me, you know, Dave, relationships are the number one thing in my life. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, to profile the people I admire out in the world, what they do, their companies. And over the past over decade, I've found no better way to do it than podcasting. I get to have someone like Dave Will, who's built a company, sold it and started a new company and is building that up. Um, talk about his journey and educate all of us on what that looks like. So if you have questions, you've thought about starting a podcast uh, and Dave has a podcast, which I'm going to mention in a second, um, you can go to rise25.com. And you know, with no further ado, Dave Will is CEO and co-founder of PropFuel. And PropFuel is a software platform that helps associations who have valuable content, products and services to offer, but maybe struggle with connecting the solutions with the right individuals at scale. He also is a host of EO 360 podcast, uh, which is a podcast by the Entrepreneurs Organization. You've had some amazing guests, by the way, Dave, on your podcast. I was checking it's, it out the other day. That's the best part, dude. You you talked about what a great uh, thing that doing podcasts are for relationships. I'll, I'll tell you what, even if there is no audience, like zero audience, I would still do this because it is just so cool to talk to some of the guests we get on, you know? You've amazing. had some amazing guests on this show. In fact, when you asked me to be on the show, I'm like, you want me or you want me to introduce you to some of my cool guests? <laughs> like what? You're modest. <laughs> you're modest. But no, you're totally right. It, it doesn't matter. It's such a good way to learn, to, even if no one's listening, and to educate yourself and then you know, your network of people. Um, so I've made best friends on the podcast, gone to weddings, gone on family vacations with people. Who knows? We'll probably grab dinner at some point when COVID disappears. I'm sure like we'll, that, we'll hang out. I'm sure that, you know, anyway, I could help your son with the Kona brand.com. I will help him. You know what I mean? And my network is oftentimes my guest network, right? And that's how it should be. Um, I want to mention too, Dave, Peach New Media was something you launched in 2001, sold it in 2015. The company at the time was 40 employees and you received an offer from a private equity group that you couldn't refuse. So that's that story. Um, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, well, I, I appreciate the invitation. There's, there's, um, I just love talking about this stuff. You know, be, being an entrepreneur has become part of my identity. You know, it's one of the top 
two or three ways I would describe myself if I had to describe myself. It, it has just become who I am. The idea of working for somebody at this point is just so far from, I, I can't even fathom working for somebody. In fact, so much so, I've got three teenage boys, so much so I think I've been a little biased in my um, rearing of the children. Now, it, it, to the point where- How so? Pushing, I just push entrepreneurship so hard. I'm like, look, you can either go bag groceries at the grocery store, or you can figure out a way to make a few bucks selling candy on the beach. You know, it's like you could make more money buying candy at Target for a buck and selling it on the beach for two bucks over the course of two hours, and you're hanging out on the on the beach too. And is it completely legal? Probably not. <laughs> But you know, who's going to get a 15 year old kid and give him a ticket for selling candy on the beach? My point being like, why would you go bag groceries? Why would you go do that when you can make money selling candy on the beach or figure out something else? In about 10 minutes, you can probably come up with a cool idea. So yeah, I'm a little jaded in, not jaded, but I'm a little uh, biased in my perspective yeah. that there yeah. is no better career than being an entrepreneur. There's one thing I wrote down, Dave, that we, we're not going to discuss now, but we will uh, before we end is you mentioned working for somebody else. And I was talking to a friend who's selling his company now. And part of that sale is working for the next company. Right. Mm -hmm. And so That's I want to hear it's tough. Yeah. Man. I want to hear your perspective on that at some point, but I, I wanted to start with your wall. Okay. If people are watching the video, Dave has a, gr a amazing wall behind him with a bunch of stuff. And I wanted to start off with the cash register. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. talk about the story behind the cash register and what that cash register means to you. All right. So, so you, you were, I, I just mentioned I have my grandmother's cash register. I don't think you really know much about this. This cash register, gosh, I'm, I wish I could bring my computer over there for a second. Um, I don't want to unplug it for fear of what that would do to our <laughs> recording here. But that cash register, so that's from, I, I want to say it's from the, um, 50s um, and and when I was growing up in in the 70s in uh, it, I visit my grandmother Mount Vernon uh, New York which is just outside of New York City not a great uh, town and her husband she's a German immigrant my grandfather's an Italian immigrant he owned a shoe shop he died at like mm. uh, she was young he died when my mother was in college and um, and you know, my, my grandmother didn't, I don't think she had any insurance. She had to figure out a way to make a living. So she actually started a health food shop in, well, I think it was the late fifties. Wow. She started a health food shop and had a little retail store. And that was her cash register from the retail wow. store that so sold health food. So I remember as a kid in the seventies, before she retired, I'd go in there and I'd play with the cash register and I'd eat her gross little honey, hard candies. And <laughs> all these gross health food stuff back in the 70s. It didn't taste really good, but the best thing in there was like these little honey candies that I would have. I think it was just actually hardened honey. It was all it was. Um, so that cash register to me is a symbol of um, fortitude. You know, it's a symbol of a woman in her 40s that went out and started a business. Imagine how... I mean, just imagine everything that an immigrant goes through where she came over here and she's, I think she was 19, 17 or 19 years old from Germany. And um, because I think this is right after World War I when all the soldiers came back to Germany and they, they, uh, there, was, there was just no economy, nothing there for women, no future. So she came to America and, uh, you know, it just one thing after another. And this was just another journey in her life was starting a store and getting it to the point that gave her a, a pretty darn healthy retirement. That's amazing. So that's that cash register. Did they say the why symbol. they came, Dave? What's that? Did they? Did your grandparents say? I'm first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your grandfather at the time. Did they say why they ended up coming here? Well, I never met my grandfather. I appreciate yeah. your condolences. Yeah. But from what I hear, is pretty cool. He's you yeah. know a, an overweight Italian a spaghetti loving cigarette smoking. A shoemaker. So yeah, I don't think he really was setting himself up for a, a long, healthy life. Um, did they say why they came over here? Opportunity. Mm. That was it. Just mm. opportunity, man. It was like, it, it just, off it is today too, but America is the land of opportunity. 
there's there's just so much that can happen here and there's so much yeah so that that's why they came over yeah. there was nothing for them in italy in germany in the um uh, early mid 1900s she was the whole foods of mount vernon right she, she was it was <laughs> i can still smell the store i can see the containers just such an amazing memory from my childhood but that cash register is is a strong symbol to me of entrepreneurship and fortitude i love it i i love health food so i'm sure like if some people would cringe at it i would actually enjoy it so much that i have a got a kegerator for my office that has a keg a fourth of a keg of kombucha that comes out of the tap so i love that stuff so i'm sure that's interesting you said kegerator i wasn't imagining kombucha it's like a, was going to be the yeah, next thing it, that exactly people are saying they they get excited and then they immediately are bummed out and say like what are you thinking so <laughs> um, the second thing on your wall I want to talk about is the sign behind you. Um, talk about the sign. If you are looking at the oars, well, yeah, that sign. Yeah. Right so this sign back here, I just got that uh, for Father's Day this year. And from, from my youngest son, who's 15, and it says, uh, walk slow, smile more. And it's been a mantra he's been hearing me preach since he was a baby. And mm -hmm. uh, so there's a little history to that. It's, it's can I, do you mind if I take us back a little bit. I want you to take me back. You don't, you don't know this. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. You picked these things out to talk about, but that, that mantra right there, walk slow, smile more, um, is a very meaningful value of mine. That's one of my, what I consider to be one of my top three personal core values. I was working for a company called SAP. Now, this is before I was an entrepreneur. I was, uh, I was in business school at Penn State. I was in between the two years. I was an intern and I went to uh, work at SAP in Boston. That's where, where I was living most of the time and where I also live now. And I remember on the way out, so fast forward now through the end of the internship and it was fine. It was interesting. I really wanted to work for them one day. And uh, Mark, my, my manager at the time, when he walked me out, he put his arm around me. This was 1996. So he put his arm around me because then that you wouldn't get sued and there's, no, there's nothing to worry about putting your arm around somebody, right? So he puts his arm around me, walks me out. And I can still picture these double doors. You know, it's amazing how impactful moments in your life just stick with you. My grandmother's health food shop and the smells and the candy. No, this is another similar moment in my life where I can remember the double doors walking out of this big office complex, what I would consider to be, it's, it's like where, you, where people go to sit in cubicles to die. You know, it's like this cubicle uh, uh, mountain. It's a mountain of office buildings all filled with cubicles. Anyway, so he's walking me out this this door and he says, you know, Dave, uh, uh, nicely done this summer. Before I let you go, um, there's a bit of advice for you. I want to encourage you when you're walking through the halls, I encourage you to walk faster and smile less because perception is reality. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's awesome. Like here I am, I don't know, 25 or something, 26, 25. And um, this guy's giving me some really, really good advice to how to succeed in, in the corporate world, which is walk faster, smile less. It's perfect because you don't have to be smart, right? It doesn't require talent. Anybody can do it. You just have to know to do it. It's like my kind of thing. You don't have to just do it. Just smile less, walk faster. And like, totally nailed it. Great advice, Mark. Thank you. And I go off to uh, a career after business school. And ultimately, like I get fired three years later, because I just cannot, Jeremy, I cannot walk faster and smile less. It just goes against the core, the nature of who I am as a person. And by the way, walk slow. So this became my mantra. And ultimately, I started a business on the, one of the core values of this business, Peach New Media, was walk slow, smile more. But something I want to emphasize, walking slow doesn't mean literally walk slow and be careless, don't care about stuff. Quite the contrary, actually. Walk slow means walking slow enough so that you're actually enjoying the journey. Walking slow is about smelling the flowers along the way because I'm, I'm a true believer that if you don't enjoy the process, if you don't enjoy the journey, there is no end. The end that we all picture off in the horizon just doesn't happen. Or if it does, you're miserable on the way there and you're probably going to be miserable at the end because you've trained yourself to be miserable. So 
walk slow, smile more, man. It's all about enjoying the journey and enjoying life because that way the destination just doesn't matter as much. That is so cheesy. I didn't realize how cheesy that sounded until <laughs> I actually heard myself say it. But I'm telling you right now, I believe in that. I've taught my kids to believe in that. My son gave me that sign for Father's Day this year. So that's the impact it's had on him. I love that. I'm still working on that, Dave. I need to just enjoy the journey more as opposed to the the outcome. Um, we all do, but yeah. don't don't get me wrong. We also get wrapped up in things. And like I think about right now at Propule, I think about selling the business. Don't get me wrong. Like I don't want to come off as holier than now. It's like I still think about selling the business, and I have to remind myself, like very very clearly, I have to remind myself. Well, I'll. I'll explain in, in story <laughs> this is gonna be a long podcast man so i remember driving in there's no such thing as, well you know they're saying same thing with copywriting like there's no such thing as long or short it's just boring copy right so right. this will be a great podcast okay right? well thank you for that yeah, so there you go. i remember driving with my wife into boston midday i, I don't know what it's for i don't know if we're going to an event or it's like maybe it was a lunch or maybe we're just i, I really don't remember it doesn't matter the point being i was driving into boston in the middle of the day we're in our fun car it's you know it's it, it, well we were in our tesla right so we're driving our tesla into boston which and i say that for a reason not not it's not like i drove a tesla which I do, by the way, it's freaking awesome. Love that car. But we're driving into Boston in this Tesla and I'm sitting here behind the wheel, hands on my lap because it's driving us itself, right? And I'm painting this picture on purpose like this. And I, I'm thinking, I'm quietly thinking, I'm not saying it to her, I'm thinking, God damn it, I really, you know, I thought Propfield would be further along, you know, I wonder, you know, if I could sell the business today, what would I sell it for? And, you know, I'm processing, like, why haven't we made it further yet? And then, like, a ton of bricks hits me. What would I do if I sold it today? Like, what, what would it mean to me if I sold this? Let's just say I sold it for $100 million, right? By the way, it's not worth $100 million. Let's just say I sold it for $100 million today, an outrageous amount of money. What, A... What impact would that have on our lives financially? It's insignificant. I'm gonna get a bigger boat, <laughs> like maybe a bigger house. I don't know. Like our house is fine. We have a boat and that's fine. We have a fun car. That's fine. Like we're paying for college. Like my finances are fine. So sell, having a hundred million in the bank isn't yeah. going to do much more for me, yeah. right? It's a good but, exercise to go through, but yeah, keep going. I well, like shit, it. I know. Yeah, so, yeah. so we get, so the money thing, it's like, it's not for the money, right? So then what's the next thing? Okay, so I wake up tomorrow, sold my business today, $100 million, like a stupid amount of money, right? What many of us would call FU money, right? So we got this FU money in the bank now. What do we do tomorrow? Assuming we're not working for the company. What do we do tomorrow? And I'm thinking there's not enough shows on Netflix to fill my days there's nor do i have this the the ability to watch that much so what would i do now i could come up with cool things but the fact is i'm kind of digging building prop fuel it's like why am i in such a rush to sell it i got it you know so i have to remind myself every now and then wait a minute stop you're digging this you're enjoying it don't jump to the finish line. Don't skip all the middle chapters of the book just to read the last chapter. Like, this is fun. This is the best part. Zuckerberg said once when he was offered $775 million from the guy at Yahoo, I forgot his name. Isn't that funny? Nobody knows the Yahoo guy, but we all know Zuckerberg. So Zuckerberg was offered $775 million and he said, no, I'm good. So the Yahoo guy comes back and he's like, okay, I'll give you a billion. Like, this is all a true story. He comes back and says, I'll give you a billion for Facebook. Zuck's like, oh, man. And so his team says to him, Zuck, maybe we ought to take this seriously. Like, maybe we ought to consider this. And Zuck's like, why? So I can go out and start another social network? Because I kind of dig the one we have. Now, I translated that in my own words, of course, but... Basically, Zuck's like, I'm kind of enjoying doing this. I don't want to sell it, even for a billion dollars. You know, it's, it's a good exercise to go through if you have a company. If you don't have a company, 
I mean, you could go through this exercise mentally by going out, you know, for instance, Dave, you go out, someone goes out, they could buy a $1 lottery ticket. And, and what that makes you think about is not that you're going to win the lottery, but what would you do differently in your life, right? If you got all of that money, what would you do differently? And then why not just do it now, right? If you're going to, oh, well, I don't like the, I'd work for a different company. Well, maybe yeah. you should start looking That's for a different company now, right? Great question that's that's how i see that and it kind of goes into so when you sold the company what did you like before you sold it what did you think you were going to do and then what happened after? oh my god that's a great question by the way going back to your life i'm going to answer that in a second yeah, go ahead. um i have a, a friend uh, uh his name is joe polish i belong to it. he's like kind of one of these i know joe polish yeah oh, you do mm -hmm. so sure. he has this group called genius network and i belong to it for a little while and but he has this philosophy um very modest name isn't it genius network <laughs> <laughs> i belong to genius network it's really difficult to get into just write a check so i uh, but anyway he has this philosophy that um i don't know a philosophy but a, a kind of a way of thinking about things he's like so um what would you sell a finger for what would you sell an arm for what about your ability to walk and he's like okay so all of those things have a value to them or maybe they're priceless so why is it that we feel so poor if we don't have money in the bank like we got all those things that are so valuable to us all the way down to a thumb right like what would you take for a thumb like i don't think there's <laughs> any money on the planet that i'd be willing to give up a thumb for i mean that's one of the only things that differentiates me from a monkey right i think like maybe a pinky anyway, a so <laughs> I, I just thought that's an interesting perspective we'll put you want to hear something funny yeah go ahead here's something funny um when i when i sold or when in the months leading up to selling peach new media this is back in 20 so this 2014 i sold it in february 2015 so late 2014 um so late 2014 i um sorry a little hiccup with the speakers there i think i got this now though so late 2014 i'm thinking about um gosh um there's about to be a significant sum of money coming into the will family at, at, and, and it was you know it wasn't 100 percent, but it was enough likely there was enough likelihood so that i started daydreaming right it started dreaming about okay what are we going to do like what does this mean like what's it going to feel like jeremy would you believe i actually thought that i would no longer get stressed out in traffic like i really thought honestly i thought like this was going to solve <laughs> that's what you thought and that's hilarious stressed. it's like you with the kegerator that was not what i was expecting you to say oh my god anyway. i thought i'd be driving in traffic i'd be like i have nothing to worry about like who gives a shit about anything else? Because now, like, we're good. Like, there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. So stupid because the money hits the bank, nothing changes. No, that's not completely true. A little bit changes. Um, but from a perspective of, of life and, and certainly from a happiness perspective, nothing changes. Mm. Nothing I could happens. see that, that mindset of like, I'm going to be less stressed. I could totally see that yeah, way and, of thinking. And, there's there's a marginal amount of reduction in stress you know marginal um mm -hmm. but my understanding is that's the, the same is true if you go from if you're making just a decent living the stress of finances generally yeah. goes away there is like, some metric completely. yeah there is something that i forgot what the number is it's like if someone made an extra seventy five thousand dollars a year after that there is no measurable difference in their happiness there's some i know there if someone could look this up it, there is some amount of money they, they've done research on if you make yeah. you know x amount over that amount there's not like a huge measure of happiness which is you know if you're thinking about it it's still hard to believe actually like okay i hand you 100 million like you're not any happier that just still seems crazy right even with a hundred million dollars yeah. and this, this does seem crazy even with a hundred million dollars there's still a significant amount of financial stress which i it's it, it you can't explain it 
uh, it's just, I think it's baked into us. You know, I, I remember the day after I sold, I sold the company. I was driving up, we live in the Northeast. I was driving up to go skiing with some friends in New Hampshire. And I remember checking my Vanguard account over and over and over and over and over on my phone uh, as safely as I possibly could while I was driving. And, <laughs> and, and we got up his Valentine's day and it was like the next day I remember we went to this, like this place on the ski resort and I, I saw this really cool flannel shirt that was incredibly overpriced, but it was like 90 bucks. And like, to me, that was a ridiculous amount of money for a shirt. And I was like, I am not going to pay $90 for a shirt. In the meantime, the deposit was just made for selling the business into our bank account. My wife, I remember my wife came up to me. She, she looked at me and just shook her head and grabbed the shirt and put it on the counter. So I ended up getting that shirt. But now every time I put on that shirt, I think of that moment where I'm like, even after getting that paycheck, I still didn't want to spend $90 on a shirt. Yeah. So yeah, and not much changes. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I will say a, a significant stress reduction is paying for college. Like that mm. done, like such a nice, like mentally just to get it out of the way. So that, that was a really nice thing. The flannel shirt. What was the good, question again? The flannel shirt's a good segue to, people check out the Kona brand.com oh, yeah. if you want a Hawaii. Wait, what, what is, what is, yeah, so my son started a business, it, which is really, really fun. It started out as a fun exercise. He, he had the idea in high school, but his thought was like, you can see I'm wearing a flannel shirt right now, traditional Browns and it's plaids and it's good. It's, it's fine. It's, it's fine. You know, it's a fine flannel shirt, but he's like, Dad, why can't we put like flowers or surfboards or palm trees on on a warm long sleeve shirt? And I was like, dude, I'd buy one. So that is the <laughs> beginning. Is so he's he's in the process now of of procuring those shirts. He's got the designs done. The designs are really really cool. He's starting really simple uh, flowers and a Nantucket red shirt and a blue. In a, in a dark blue. So he's starting with some cool shirts. In the meantime, he's got some cool Kona brand hats. Uh, every purchase goes to re helping rescue dogs. So his, mm. his, his mission is to um, basically save every, re find a home for every dog. That's what it was, find a home for every dog. And so he's, he has this idea of these shirts called The Kona Brand. That's the name of the website, thekonabrand.com. And the idea is like, you put on one of these shirts and it just gives you, it puts a smile on your face. That's his philosophy. He's like, just if, if an article of clothing can make you smile, this is the one. So the about selling the company and yeah. what you thought, and I want to transition to you're staying on the company, right? You said like, it's hard mm -hmm. for an entrepreneur to work for someone else. Talk about that transition from you sell the company and now you're working for the company. Yeah. So AKKR, um, Excel AKKR bought, uh, they're the private equity firm that bought uh, my company, Peach New Media. We were a bolt-on to another software company, a bigger software company. And um, uh, so I remember going to work for them, and immediately I was put on the executive team for this other company. And I was in a work farm. I had a contract for a year. And then after that, we can see what happens. But the the idea was like, I'm bound to work for them for a year and I remember sitting on the, I want to say like six months into this, I was on the, I don't even know what I did. Like I have zero memory of that first six months. I think it was just all transition stuff. And um, it was fine. It was interesting. It was fun to transition to business uh, and, and make sure nobody was panicking. And very, very, I don't think anybody was let go. We might have let go maybe one or two people related to finance and HR kind of thing. but. Um, uh, so, so this was, uh, uh, so six months in, I'm sitting on the executive team, uh, meeting, we're on this little one day retreat and the CEO mentioned, um, mentioned the company values. And I, I stopped for him. I was like, I'm so embarrassed, but can you remind me like, what are our values? <laughs> like six months in, I was like, can you just remind me what are our values? And she looked at me with such disdain and disappointment. I was so embarrassed not to know our values. She's like, you don't know our values kind of thing. And I was like, I'm really sorry. I don't, uh, what are they? And, and then she's, 
I think she said them, but then somebody else, thank God, spoke up and was like, Krista, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I don't really know the values either. And all of a sudden, it sparked this conversation about how this company had bought so many businesses, brought them all together, that the values were no longer clear. And so it turned into another hour or two of talking about, you know, what, what are we weak at? What are we good at? So when the group came back together, um, after this, you know, sticky notes everywhere, group came back together and determined that, okay, what we were going to do is block off some time and lock ourselves in a room, come up with our company values next weekend. And I pushed back again. I was a troublemaker. That's what it was. I honestly, like, here's a company, private equity. They want to focus on the money, get it in, just move, 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 which is cool. But being an entrepreneur. Walk fast. Yes. They wanted to walk fast, really, really fast. And, and so I was like, wait a minute, if we just go in a closet and do this again in six months from now, we're going to be wondering what our values are again. If we want to do this right, we need to bring the employees into it. And I don't mean to sound all righteous. I mean, I don't know the greatest process, but I do know a better process. And I, but in a nutshell, I was told, look, we're going to do it next weekend. I appreciate your input. <laughs> we're, we don't have six months to spend on creating our values. Like that was the value. That was the value put on company values. Like we just don't have six months to dedicate to something like this. So uh, that's the moment I knew I was done. And I, I remember calling her and, and saying, hey, listen, I, I think we we're seven or eight months in at this point. It's like, listen, um, I don't want to give up the, the, the end of year bonus but I'm happy to get out of your hair if you, if you give me my end of year bonus. Like if you don't require me to stay around a year, I don't need to be here. And she's like, consider it done. <laughs> so, so is that getting fired? I don't think so. I think I quit. <laughs> so, so what no, advice would you have? It was very amicable, by, by the way. She said, yeah, let's, let's kind of make it a smooth transition over the next month or six weeks. And so I was there for another a month or two. And, but ultimately it was a very smooth transition, but I, I just couldn't see eye to eye. I was, I was definitely becoming a troublemaker in the group. I was not helping anymore. Yeah. What, um, do you have any, any particular advice for a founder And all situations are totally different, right? Um, who acquires, who's, you know, who you're working with and advice from a founder who, you know, maybe they're going to work for the new company for a year, two years, three years, four years. Uh, any advice? I, I think there's just so many different situations. Like, I, I think there's a lot of people that actually look forward to working and, and taking their baby and bringing it through the next stage, the next stage being work for a company. So I don't think every situation is like mine. I think there are a lot of situations like mine. Um, do I, I don't, uh, forgive me. I, I don't think I have any advice because again, I think everything's so, so different. What I will say is in the acquisition process, right? When you're looking at who to sell to, like if, if you've made a decision that you're going to sell and you have a few different lined up, that wasn't our scenario. In fact, we were cranking along expecting to stay who we were. We were, it, it, they came to us asking, it just happened. We had two private equity com companies come to us at the same time. So that worked out nicely because we kind of um, pitched them off each other. But um what I would say is we, we oftentimes think so much about whether or not we're a good culture fit into the other company. I'd say don't overthink that. That might be my advice is you think you can see it. You think you might be able to figure out if it's a good culture fit. The reality is even if you think it's a great culture fit, it's going to be tough as hell. Like it is really, really hard to bring companies together. There will be change. And if you're not comfortable with that, figure out a way to get out of it because there will be change no matter what they say. Yeah. So Dave, we go from you're selling, you're thinking about selling, now you transition. When you uh, transition and you're like, cool, now what am I gonna do? Oh, I watched The Godfather. The Godfather. That's the first thing I did. Nine hours. Oh, Nine no, hours. I mean. 
Yeah, it took me like three weeks because I, I just really had a hard time sitting down for nine hours straight. But I, I took three weeks and I watched The Godfather. The other thing I was going to do is going to clean out my basement. And I'm still going to get to that soon. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to get to that one of these days. You know, we hired. Is there a an, question? We Sorry. hired an organizer, like, because my wife threatened me if I didn't clean out the office area. So we actually hired an organizer, a professional organizer. They came in and spent a whole Sunday with me and organized and cleaned the entire office. So, um, wow. it, they're in Chicago. Really, yeah. What was that really? Um, David well, Allen um, book. David uh, Allen. Getting no, things done. I know David oh, no. Allen. There's another no. one. Uh, the the subtle art of uh, of tidying up or something like that, and it, basically it's about going after Every, your basement, attacking your basement, and just getting rid of everything. That, That's the subtle art, by the way. Right, getting rid of everything. Yes. So there you go. You just just hire an organizer. You can yeah. make that happen. I don't know if I let you ask your question. There was a no. question in there somewhere. Sorry. I don't even remember what it was. No, it was, um, what was, what were you thinking was next? Were you going to give yourself some time to relax? Were you on to your next thing? Yeah. Well, what I wish I did was just took a year and did nothing, but that's really hard because you kind of feel like, you feel like you're going to miss something. Like it, there's a huge fear of missing out. Like it's really, really hard to take a year, but I really wish I forced myself to take a year just explore just even with kids in school you can't just pick up and go to europe right but just let my mind explore and instead what i did is i said yes to everything i could like board member of local organizations uh did more with the boy scouts which i'm heavily involved in i, I just did everything i could and i found myself running around like a chicken with my head cut off purposeless like i didn't have one thing i was working on I just was working on all these, like a bunch of little things, and I was busy, 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 busy every day. And what was I doing, Jeremy? I have no idea. Like, I have no idea. So maybe I, that's I exactly what you needed at the time, you know? I don't know. I look back on it, and I don't feel like that's what I needed. It didn't feel mm -hmm. good. I was, you know what I did? All of a sudden, my calendar emptied and I filled it with just shit. Like, everything I could put into it, I just filled it with that. Can I swear on this? Sure. All right, because I already have a few times. <laughs> You're right, good. I'll stop. I will consciously put a filter on if I have to. But I just mm. filled it, right? I filled this calendar, this bucket with stuff just because it was empty. And it's not supposed to be, so I filled it. I wish I could go back in time. In fact, I have to do a do-over sometime. When I sell prop fuel, my next step will actually be to shut down, take a year, say no. Because do you remember when we were kids, not you and me together, but generally speaking as kids, we would get bored. And what happens when you get bored as a kid? You do crazy things. Like uh, you might be bored for a few minutes and then all of a sudden there's a box in the corner. Next thing you know, you're on a spaceship flying out to Mars, right? It's like you, your mind just finds ways to fill the void with creative, interesting things. And I didn't let myself do that. But um, that, that's what I did wrong. Hmm. What I did right was over, and I, I, I kind of lost track of time, but over time, I would have an idea and I'd pursue it for a month, asking questions, talking to people, and, and then I'd let it go. Because oftentimes these ideas, I'd run into a, a wall and be like, okay, do I care enough about this to want to like break through that wall or not? And I didn't for all of them. And then uh, and every time I went to my current partner, Cameron, who was my CTO at my last company at Peach, I go, hey, Cameron, I got another idea. What do you think about this? Like a, a website or a, a platform to, to find jobs for interns. That was one of them. Um, hey, Cam, what about this one? A, a swag company site with focusing on birthdays. He's like, oh, my God. He just went back to work. He had a job. And I was like, so I went to him with like five more ideas like this. Every time he was like, just go back to the Godfather. And so finally he came to me with one idea. I was like, I'm in. That's great. <laughs> so the point is the idea didn't really matter much. All that mattered is I had Cameron with me, my, my, uh, my right-hand man, my partner that I built prop fuel with our current company. It started as his idea. Here's the funny thing. When you start something, I wonder how many people listening have had this experience. 
But when you start a business, and this was true with my first company too, when you start a business, the idea doesn't matter because it's going to morph and change so much to the market demand. Like you might start with something, but then for us, you know, every three months we pivoted another 15 degrees until finally we're just pointing in a completely different direction. Like what we are today is not at all what we were four years ago when we started. So anyway, that's my little diatribe on I what like it. we do after. I want to talk about that for a second, morphing, because one of my favorite parts of your journey, Dave, is how Walmart plays a role. How did you know that? I, I do my research. That's crazy. Like, I don't, that's, that's pretty good. My dog does my research for my podcast. He's never <laughs> gone that deep with somebody. That goes way, way back. That like, that's impressive. I wonder where that is. Um, I do remember. Well, anyway, we don't need to go there, but yeah, well, so yeah, go on. No, no. I just want you to tell the story because you discovered, uh, I mean, that, that kind of, I think led you to a certain niche, right? Yeah, totally. In, totally. In Peach New Media. Yeah. That, my God, that's, that's awesome that you've, you found that. So uh, by the way, you're giving me too much credit. I didn't discover Walmart. Um, my partner at the time, my first company, so I started with another guy named Rick and he was a mentor and a friend. And that was my first company, which was the early, early days of Peach. And it was basically just a web conferencing reselling company. Like we just, and it wasn't even called Peach. Uh, it's called, it called Boston Conferencing. And uh, sounds official. Although, <laughs> and everybody's like, why? You work outside of Boston. I was like, I know, but it's like Boston Consulting Group. It's like huge. So it does have um, that ring to it. So we, we were pretty big on consumer goods. Like that was our niche. And we were selling web conferencing to tired old sales executives. That was like our segment. That was our market. And just to help them, this is in the early 2000s, to help them get into like the, the, the new way of communicating with their sales teams around the country. And our first company, our first customer was Solo Cup Company, just to give you perspective. And so we worked with the sales and marketing team inside Solo mm. Cup. They're huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and they sell stuff at Walmart, as do many of the other companies that we started working with. And so finally, my partner um, said, hey, there's this thing called Retail Link, which is Walmart's software. And there's like 60,000 manufacturers that use Retail Link and they have these user groups all over the country. Do you want to host one of these things for free? Just do it on your, you know, using your platform just because otherwise people have to drive into Boston. This is just a local Boston one. People have to drive into Boston. Uh, and nobody ever goes. It's like we have three or four people in our user group meetings because nobody feels like spending the day driving and parking in Boston. I mean, it was, it was basically like virtual back in 2002. And, um, and so I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, at first I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, I've got to do another thing for free. But <laughs> all right, fine. So I ended up doing this thing. 90 people showed up to this user group meeting. It was a smash. Like it killed it. So in no time at all, we started doing, the word got out, we started doing these retail link user group meetings all across the country. And at this point, we'd figured out a business model where we just charged people, I think, um, I forgot exactly, but let's just say it was like 25 bucks for a session. So instead of paying parking, they'd pay us 25 bucks and then they wouldn't even have to drive. So 25 bucks to get into a user group, they paid us directly. We built websites uh, to access uh, the, 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 the recordings and, and the meetings and all that. So it basically became a learning management system that we had built. It was a one-off specifically for the retailing user group, which is a Walmart community of manufacturers. What we discovered is that we, and this is what I'm talking about morphing, but we had discovered is we had created a, um, a, a, a learning site. We didn't even know the word learning management system. Uh, we didn't know what that was. I don't even know if that was a thing. I mean, in what, what was, yeah. What the internet at that point? Well, I mean, just to give you a perspective of what was, on, what was popular on the internet at that time? Like, oh, that's a good question. Like I don't my space. I mean, I don't even know. What yeah, was, I guess so. I Facebook wasn't around and, yeah. and I, I, Apple really wasn't doing anything on the internet at that point. I don't think other than like, um, they had yeah. iTunes, but that wasn't even the internet. I mean, WordPress didn't exist. I mean, right. I mean, yeah, it's really interesting. It, I don't think the concept of learning management systems existed. Now I could be wrong there. Maybe it was in the early days. So we had kind of stumbled into this concept of 
hosting and distributing educational content from a website. And we also had stumbled into this idea of a community of people all focused on a similar cause, otherwise known as an association. So what we had realized is that the Retail Link user group was actually an association of manufacturers focused on the, the Retail Link software. And so we, dis, we, we applied that concept and went to the, the, what's called American Society of Association Executives. It was the Association of Associations. And we figured we'd go and buy a booth there and just see, you know, what do we have here? And so we started selling this concept of, hey, we could build a website where you could host educational content. Do you want us to do that for you? And at this point, people are shipping out tapes and CDs. That's what associations were doing at the time. And they're like, yeah, we'd love to put all our stuff on the internet and let people access it. And, and so uh, we ultimately figured out how to do that much better over time and set up these sites much faster. We rebranded as Peach New Media and voila, that over the course of just voila, over 14 year Boom. Yeah. Ten, boom. Ten, overnight success after 10 years. Yeah, boom. 14 years later, we sold it. Yeah. You know, what I love about when you about this is that you really found this community, this larger community, right? In this case, Retail Link, and you solved a pain point for them, right? Um, and, you know, that's what you did. You went on to solve a pain point for this community. And in the same, you kind of stumbled upon solving that pain point for other communities, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, so, yes. I mean, instead of community, the word we were chasing down because we had really changed our focus at this point to focus on associations or, or probably more accurately, accurately member-based organizations. That's kind of what an association is. It's a member-based organization. So Dave, prop fuel, original idea versus now, because you said it is, even yeah. that has morphed a few times. So originally it was a recognition platform, <laughs> like good job, props, prop fuel, you know, mm. hey, good job. And it was just a way for employees to give each other a pat in the back. That was at 25 bucks a month. And um, we had a, a beta with a whole bunch of friends and their businesses using it. Um, so that was the original idea. Uh, it did not work out. So well, we and we discovered that pretty quickly. We we're pretty agile um, in terms of creating a, a test, putting it out there, seeing if anybody bit. Nobody really bit. So ultimately, and we still do some of that. But ultimately, it turned into. I mean, I'm going to fast forward. I'm I'm not going to take you through the journey of how we got to where we are. But ultimately, we found our way back to working with associations. Primarily, we're working member based organizations, but it works. We we actually have a fair number of our original corporate customers as well. It's a conversational engagement platform. And what that means is it's a way of connecting with large groups of people at the individual level. So we all know our customer base. We all know our, our in, in, the, in the case of associations, they're members, 30,000 members maybe for a typical association. They know what their membership as a whole needs, right? They know that you could send out a survey and find out what percentage of your members need this and that. What they don't know is what Jeremy needs. Not only that, but what does Jeremy need right now? And that's what PropFuel does. PropFuel, through a conversational engagement, we have this process, ask, capture, act. So it, it's like a marketing platform, marketing automation platform that sends out emails with a question in it. People answer the question. Based on how they answer the question, this is the beauty of PropFuel is, is what happens after people answer a question, all of these actions come to life. And so you have all these workflows that it, it's like, it's like lighting, a, lighting a firecracker. You're, the light is the question, the, the wick is the person's answer, and then as soon as that wick comes, it explodes with actions. And the actions are show people a landing page, write data back to the database, um, send them an email, you know, there's, tag them in the database. And there's all kinds of things that might happen after somebody answers a question. But here's the beauty. Now we know something about them and we can give them a relevant message. You specifically, we can give you specifically a relevant message. And then that starts a dialogue back and forth between the individual and the organization. So now, rather than an organization talking to personas, organizations are talking to people actual people 
And that's what PropFuel does. PropFuel is, allows you to create these one-to-one -one connections with people at scale. It's awesome. It's like, it's just awesome. There's no other uh, platform that I'm aware of that does this kind of thing. So people say, who are your competitors? I'm like, well, I guess kind of HubSpot, but we're more complimentary. You're not going to get rid of HubSpot. You're just going to tack us on to use as a way to create a different connection with members. You're still going to broadcast shit out there. Like you're still going to send stuff. So anyway, that's my long winded messages to what our value proposition is. It's about I want to hear connection. Dave, your favorite example. Um, but before I do, like, it's funny because when I look at Peach New Media, I'm curious if anyone told you this when you started PropFuel, when you look at Peach New Media and now you're doing PropFuel, it makes perfect sense to me. I'm like, oh, they're a software platform that helps associations, you know, connect the dots or whatever. I wondered if you would have, if you went to someone at the time, go, we want to help, you know, recognition. And they're like, Maybe you were helping recognition for associations or were you helping recognition for associations or member-based software? It just seems so obvious when I you know, researched your website now, it's like, yeah, that makes perfect sense what he came from there. And now he's kind of- It does. I don't know what on, happened. You know what I mean? We were smoking something and just decided <laughs> to go. Honestly, I thought, I, I think we were kind of burned out on the industry and we're like, well, let's just do something different. Yeah. I think that's what happened. And we tried something different. And we're like, we don't know what we're doing over here. <laughs> Can we just, maybe we should just go back to what we know. Well, let's, let's go back to what we know. Yeah. We know the people, we know the problems, we know the industry. Yeah. It, it, in hindsight, it was foolish to go off and try something just completely different. Like we might as well just started a, a, a winery. I mean, when you said, oh, this more prop feel more, I was thinking, this seems like it would have been the idea from the beginning, but it just proves no matter if you've started companies before you haven't, it's going to morph regardless of how much you experience you have doing this. What is one of your favorite examples of a company using prop fuel? Oh gosh, there's so many. Uh, here's, here's one that I think is really easy to understand. And because I think this applies both to companies, organizations, and, and, and associations as well. Um, association brings on it and there's like a whole bunch of different use cases uh, from member acquisition to uh, to to losing customers or losing members of an organization and trying to win them back and the best way to do that is to ask them a question to get some context what's going on here and then based on what you learn now you can really have a, a connected conversation, a relevant message with them. But here's a good example. Like somebody joins an association or somebody joins your company, either as an employee or as a, maybe a customer. So I'm trying to make this broad. With an association, what'll happen is you join an association like the national, let's just say you're into matchbox cars. National Association of Vintage Matchbox Cars. There's an association for There's an association for everything. It's Unbelievable like how many it does. So the, the National Association of Match, Matchbox Car Vendors or something like that. So you decide to join that association. What they will do in most cases is send you an email with a ton of things that they're doing. Their conference, their webinars, their educational events, their, their exchange where you can sell Matchbox cars, everything, their community where you can talk about your Matchbox car, everything. And they're gonna dump it like a dump truck into your lap. And maybe you eat it up, maybe you don't. Maybe you have the filter to go through it and figure out what's interesting and what isn't. What we'll do with one of these organizations, instead of dumping this into your lap, we're gonna send a question to you that says, hey, we're so glad you joined the Matchbox Association. But before we go any further, tell us, why did you join? And then it might have some multiple choice. Because remember, I told you, associations know their membership. So they could tell you like the top five reasons. What they wanna know is, Jeremy, why did you join? Because based on why you joined, that's going to impact our next conversation or the next element of this conversation. Oh, you joined because you have a whole bunch of uh, Matchbox cars you want to offload? Oh, check out our, our Matchbox exchange. Oh, you joined because you're looking to acquire Matchbox? Oh, you joined because you're looking to clean up your Matchbox? I don't know. So based on how you answer, you give them the right uh, uh, next step. 
And so what we'll do is over the course of the, the member's first year, the customer's first period of time, you send them questions on a weekly or monthly basis or periodically over the course of the year to make sure that they're actually getting involved and in doing what they should in the first year. So you've got them locked in for life. So that's an example it. of how organizations are using PropFuel. Ask, capture, act. It's asking questions, capturing context, and taking action on it. Yeah. No, I love it because you could tailor their experience and they have a better experience because you're tailoring and giving them exactly what they want as opposed to just kind of shotgun approach and throwing everything at them. And like you said, you probably build out the, you know, they build out these email trees or decision trees. Like, okay, they answer this. They already kind of know where to point people. They already have the resources. So, you know what? Marketing today is done on clicks and opens. You know, we're looking at transactional behavioral data to try to predict the future, right? We're trying to predict what they want. And there's some value to that. I'm not, I'm not putting that down. There's, there's real value to that. But wouldn't there be some value to just saying, hey, Jeremy, what do you want? You know, like here's an, here's an example. And then I'll, I'm going to stop talking about this because I don't want to be dead horse here. You walk, to the, walk into the doctor's office. The, the receptionist gives you a piece of paper. Usually you fill out this form. You know, do you ever remember those, the pictures of the human body? Where does it hurt? And you're like, X right here. My hip hurts because I'm 50. And, and so you need to circle and level of pain, eight. So you're, you're kind of filling out the data, right? That's the data. We have all this data about people. And they, then you walk in, they take your blood pressure. And they, I don't know what else they do, but they're, they're looking they at you. They weigh you or something. They weigh you. Thank, yes. So they're getting all this data. But then the doctor walks in. He's looking at his clipboard. He's looking at the data. It's important. But what's the first thing he says to you? Tell me what's going on with you. How are you feeling? What's yeah. going on? Why are you here? Like it's contextual. So now he's starting a conversation with you because what matters as much, if not more than that data, is what you say to him next. Well, doc, my back's been killing me. Or doc, this weird snapping is happening when I walk. Something's going on in my hip. Or doc, I get this lump. You know, like stuff like that matters a hell of a lot more than your heart rate. Anyway, so that's, that's yeah. what PropFuel does. We are that yeah. doctor that walks in and asks a question. Yeah. I want to hear, Dave, about um, one of the most obscure business associations that you've heard of. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're speaking my language. You know, my background is as a chiropractor. My background is in biochemistry as a chiropractor. So I totally, you know, you, people fill out a laundry list of things. But when you ask them what's, what's going on, it, it sometimes has nothing to do with what they filled out on the form, right? They go, yeah. I've had seven surgeries and this and that. And I'm like, whoa. And they're like, I actually have headaches. I'm like, okay. You know, the, so you just, you don't know what's going on with someone that day, even looking at past history, right? So are there, just to give people an idea of all the different, like you mentioned the matchbox, what other obscure associations just blew your mind, even though that you are, you know, just, an expert probably at this point of all the various associations out there. Well, you know what? I, I vaguely remember this one. Here it is. The International Fainting Goat Association. But in looking for that, because I couldn't quite remember the name, I typed in goat association. And it, it's stunning how many goat associations there are. National Pygmy Goat Association, Nigerian Dwarf Goat Association, Spanish wow. Goat Association, Pakistan. Goat. I mean, that's just goat associations. And those are, inter oh, here's one, Iowa Meat Goat Association. That's an unfortunate one. But I, I can tell you some of the no more normal associations are still quite obscure. I mean, the number of hospice associations is really, really interesting. Um, one of our clients is the Coin Laundry Association. They, it's an association of of laundromats, basically. You have, um, what's, what's another one? The contemporary, CCSA, contemporary um, uh, Ceramic Society of America, CCSA. Contemporary Cera C Ceramic Society of America is these little ceramic stores. And then, of course, you have some of the more popular ones, like all the bar associations are, are um, every state has a bar association, a national bar association. There's the state teachers associations. Every state has their own teachers association. Um, 
we work with the Air Force Association, you know, obviously a big one. So there's there's some that are very obscure and, and fun to come up with, like the Matchbox one. I really don't know if there's yeah. a Matchbox Association. There are probably, if there's a, that many GOAT associations, Dave, I'm going to guess there's a Matchbox Association. There has to be. Yeah, I'm looking right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Bay Area Matchbox Collectors Association. There you go. National Association of Matchbox Collectors. Matchbox As- uh, Association. No, that's a different one. Anyway, that, isn't that funny? It's crazy. Yeah. You know, Dave, I have one last question. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing the journey. Thanks for Dude, this is, imparting uh, you your advice. Well, you who know, would I, ever turn down the opportunity to talk about their story and their the, the, talk about themselves? My God. This is like the best date ever. What else do you want that's to know? A, about that's me? a new quote on my website. <laughs> the best date ever. Um, um, before I ask the last question, I want to point people towards propfield.com. Check it out. You know, if you do, like you were mentioning with Dave, there's so much you can learn. Dave, I don't care if you're, you're an association or you're a business. I mean, people should check out the site just to see what you've created. Um, and Thank especially you. if you are an association, obviously check out what Propfield is doing because, you know, going through, their value proposition is just clear. Who they're serving is clear. The problem they're serving is clear. You go to the services, you know, the different services they offer, you know, provide a, a value and a pain point for member-based, you know, associations. So check it out. Check out what I they're doing that. there. Thank you. Yeah. It, it, and we do work with some, I mean, really our target audience is the niche. It's the, it's the associations. But we do work with some corporations and, and the, the, the methodology of Ask, Capture, Act is universal. I mean, it works in just about every situation. You know why? Because it's how humans interact. You go to a cocktail party, you ask a question, you capture, you listen, right? And then you take action on it. You, it's an exchange. And all we've done is turn that exchange, the conversation into a process. Yeah. So check out propfield.com, check out other episodes of inspiredinsider.com and check out rise25.com. Last question, Dave, I have to ask this question because you mentioned it in the very beginning of before we started recording. And, um, you know, one of the most powerful things is curiosity. So I need to close the loop. Um, I'm of, so curious of, what this is going to be. Like, of, I, I'm dying to know what you're going to ask. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the very beginning about Mets game and I, the lizard. And so I, I, I made a note on the pad in front of me. Uh, if anyone could see that, this is my notes that I'm, I have for this interview. That's but, all um, I have written, I wrote down Mets game and lizard. So Oh my God. I need so to hear I, about that. The way this came up is I was telling you, like, I went to a conference once where I learned it was a sales session. And basically, we're talking about selling using stories. And, and you really should make a list of stories that are entertaining or interesting. And, and over time, you'll have an application for just about every one of them. This is one that I never really found an application for, but it, it sure is a fun story. How long do we have, man? This is because honestly, okay, I'm going to tell the story because it is so fun to tell a story. You can hang up now. If you're, you know what, go on to the next <laughs> podcast. If you're not if, interested. Listen, we've I'm, already opened the loop. So like, if, I'm they, if you don't want to hear about Mets game and lizard, you can I'm, hang up now. Okay. I'm so glad you already gave all the credentials and like all that stuff because this one's okay. So here I am just out of college with my buddy, Dave Bonanno, like this. So I'm 50 now. Right. So this is like, this has got to be 25, 27 years ago, something like that. And, and, uh, where we were living in Boston or Connecticut, he was in Connecticut. I was in Boston and he calls me up and he's like, Hey, you want to go to a baseball game? And I'm thinking like Fenway or, or yeah, that actually, I don't know what else I was thinking. I was just thinking, sure. You know, it's like, let's go, come on up. And he's like, actually, no, uh, let's go to Shea stadium in, in New York. And like, all right. So like just, you know, because that's what you do when you're 23 years old. You just jump in your car like, sure, I'll pick you up in an hour and a half. So I get to his house, pick him up. We drive to Chase Stadium. And I think the reason was because the tickets were so cheap. So we get to the parking lot. We buy these tickets like twelve seventy five for the nosebleeds. And so we get- How long is it drive? From where you were oh it was like four hours okay so and i can't remember if was, we planned this day before or whatever but we get to shea stadium before the game starts and we get our tickets and we just buy the cheapest tickets at ticket office and they were 1275 i remember that very clearly and they were 1275 and so we we go into shea stadium we walk up 
the you know those those ramps you walk up in these stadiums and it's like never ending ramps that you're walking up and up and there's crowds of people and finally like you can see almost all of New York City off in the background <laughs> and 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 it's like you can look down and you can kind of see the pitcher's mound and stuff you're like wow this is awesome but this, these are the seats 1275 gets you so we go up to the usher and the usher looks at our ticket and he goes ooh you know he shakes his head we're like what they really that bad he's like well i could get you better I'm like what do you mean he's like well for five bucks i could get you seats right behind home plate where you can catch a fly ball we're like i can't believe i can remember the story like this i seriously haven't told the story in about seven or eight years i think so i'm like we'd love to catch a fly ball so so what do we do and i reach my wall he's like no 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 he's like go down to section a1 go up to the usher tell him the lizard sent you i was like what <laughs> and dave and i my buddy and i look at each other what larry sent us no tell him the lizard sent you I'm like this is just so bizarre so we go back down the ramp like all the way down the ramp this is like a cartoon now it's like a monty python thing so we back down the ramp go to section a1 and we walk up and we go up to the usher and we're like hey um uh, the lizard sent us and the guy's like he rolls his eyes like you want to see that guy and he points to the other entrance for a1 you know how like these things have two entrances so we the other one is see i told you dude the, you, you made a mistake asking the story not at all so this is exactly to, what I was expecting. We go to the <laughs> other A1. We go up to that guy and we're like, hey, uh, the lizard sent us. And he's like, oh, yeah, what'd he tell you? Now, this is New York, right? This is Shea Stadium in New York. And this guy is as shady as you can imagine. And we walk up and he's like, oh, yeah, what'd he tell you? And we're like, well, he said for five bucks, we could get seats right behind home plate where we get a fly ball. And he's like, yeah, that's right. And so we, we reached him while I said, hey, 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 hey. He says, come on in. He brings us in the aisle, like in the hallway in between like the main area where you buy the hot dogs and in the stadium part. So we go in this hallway and we give him our 10 bucks for the two of us. And he's like, all right. He walks us down and we get into these beautiful seats, like these amazing seats right beyond home plate where in theory, if there wasn't a net there, we could have caught a fly ball. <laughs> So, but we had these amazing seats right behind home plate for twelve seventy five plus five bucks. So, we're loving this game. Like ten minutes later, another usher walks up. And he's like, "Hey!" and he points us out. Like nobody else, he points at us. He's like, "Let me see your tickets." And we both look at each other and we pause. And we're like, "Shit!" Because these tickets do not go to these seats, by the way. And we don't know what to do. So I just like. Hey, the lizard sent us like I no idea what to say. I'm just like, hey, but the lizard sent us just hoping there was some. And the guy's like, all right. And he walked away. The people <laughs> in front of us were dying laughing. Like they must have experienced it because they're probably season ticket holders. They probably experience the lizard every week. But somehow the lizard had quite some pull at Shea Stadium. So needless to say, we enjoyed the game. We didn't catch a fly ball, but it was a phenomenal game. Awesome seats. So that night, I, I don't know where I slept. I don't know if I went back to Boston or spent the night in New York or what, but I remember having a dream. And I'm not making this up. This is a true story. Every piece of every single piece of this is a true story. And that night I had a dream that I had asked out this beautiful girl. You know, I was a bachelor, I was 23, I was horny. And so I asked out this beautiful, beautiful girl and we went out to dinner and I still didn't know anything about girls at 23. And, and I remember, this is a dream, by the way, this part's a dream. And I, in my dream, I remember going out to dinner with her and we sat down and we had dinner and then I reached my wallet, no wallet. I didn't know what to do. I was so embarrassed already, I said, excuse me. And I go up, go up to the what is it, maitre d'. Is that what you call a guy to, like at the front of a fancy restaurant, maitre d'? I feel like that's a hotel. Thanks. Anyway, go up to the guy with the fancy mean, yeah. suit, the guy that takes your money and seats you and all this. Like, listen, I I'm on a date. Forgot my wallet. I don't know what to do. But the lizard sent me. And in my dream, I actually used that line. The lizard sent me. And he's like, no problem, sir. We've got you covered. 
That was that's the lizard, man. I that's the it. story of the lizard. So if ever you're in a pickle, well, I probably wouldn't. Well, try I'm it, just but. wondering if you go back to the stadium. I yeah, mean, they, they were probably. Pretty Is there old, a legend so, of the lizard? Yeah. There's, you know, it's really interesting though. For talk about entrepreneurship, I mean, there's some organized scam going on there, and they weren't making big bucks. It's like five bucks here, five bucks there. These are probably just a couple kids that figured out they could get their beer money for the night. Though I mean, also like they saw an opportunity. Maybe those season ticket holders never show up, so that yeah. they can just take someone from the nosebleeds, make their dreams come true, and sit behind for five the whole bucks. Foot. Yeah, five that's bucks, a steal. Though. He probably could have charged. 10 a piece or 15 oh, a piece, God, you know? So funny. So that yeah. was probably a little bit of a longer story than you were expecting yeah. when I told you I had it. I didn't know if I had an expectation. I had no expectation when I queued you up with Mets game and lizard. I, I, I did not know it was coming next. I, I got to say that story though. I, that is probably one of my favorite stories to tell because it brings me back to a time in my life that was just so carefree where somebody calls you like, yeah, why wouldn't I drive four hours to see a baseball game when I don't even care about baseball? Like, <laughs> yeah, of course. But I mean, it, it, there's a lot of, even though it's meant to be a fun story, there's a lot of lessons like connections, like connections are everything, right? I mean, you could be in the nosebleeds and one connection takes you right to the right behind home plate. Just one connection. And I always feel like we're one connection away from whatever, like your son's one connection away from getting amazing advice for, you know, the Kona brand. We're all one connection. So the lizard, I use a hell of a connection, man. <laughs> I knew the lizard. In, in entrepreneurship too, Dave, it's like, sometimes you're just, God, I'm in the nosebleeds and, and just it's just like one tweak to get to the front row. You know what I mean? One tweak. Mm -hmm. So anyways, thank you. Everyone check out propfield.com. <laughs> check out more episodes of the podcast. If you've stayed this long, you deserve this is it. a long so, one, dude. Thank oh you. Oh, my God. Thanks, oh everyone. My God. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Dave. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.